Welcome! In this series of videos, we will cover the design and implementation of a project, from initial design through coding and development to testing, using the PowerBasic Windows compiler. Today we will continue our project to look at the use of software autoforms by adding form navigation. In this project so far, we have created a generic form runner application. This form runner application when run will display a list of forms. These forms are configured in CSV files. The content of each of these files describes the layout of a dialog. If we launch our first dialog, we can see on screen a number of Windows controls. Labels, text boxes, list boxes, and a drop down list, as well as a couple of buttons. The functionality supports tooltips, as well as the user entering information and pressing the OK button. Inside the Forms folder is the definition of this auto form executable. This is the executable that will read the config file. This is what the user has selected when they wish to run a form. If we have a look at one of these CSV files, we'll see that it describes each of the objects that appears on the dialog. The title of the dialog itself, the buttons, the labels, the text boxes, the drop down list, and the list box. In this configuration file, we have the identifier for each of these objects. We also have the position on screen defined as X and Y coordinates, as well as the width and the height of the object. For those objects the user can interact with, we have defined tooltips. And for the text boxes, we can have a maximum number of characters. And we can also specify which of the user enterable fields are actually mandatory. This allows us to set up a configuration for each new dialog we wish to create, without doing any programming at all. When a user enters data into these fields and presses the OK button, it will save the data to a designated CSV file. The output CSV file is defined on the OK button in the configuration field in the field name column. If we have a look in the data folder and have a look at the user data, we can see at the moment there is one record in this file. This is what we've completed so far. What we're going to do today is to add some form navigation buttons on the auto form application to allow the user to move forward and backward in the list of forms that have been filled in. This will allow the user to navigate through each of the forms and make what changes they wish to each form. So in order to make these changes, let's have a look at the code. The auto forms application takes a command line parameter and that is defined in our IDE in the set command line. This is the path and the name of the configuration file. This allows us to run this application on its own without having to run the form runner application. So what we want to do is to add some navigation buttons to the top of the auto form application. So we will first need some icons. So I've created five icons to allow the user to navigate through the list of forms that have been completed. So we're going to add five resource commands to our source code to allow us to load in each of the icons that we want to use. The first one, the reports icon, is going to be for the application itself. The other five are going to be for the buttons. And we're going to add in a new library, buttonplus.bass. This will allow us to put icons on our buttons. Next, we want to add these controls to the dialog itself. So if we go to our main dialog, and we'll add a control add button entry for each of these buttons so that they appear at the top right hand corner of our dialog. Since we're going to be navigating through each of the forms in turn, we want an indication at the top of the screen to say which form we're actually looking at. So we're going to add a label at the top right hand corner of the screen that tells the user which form number they're actually on. So since we've added a number of objects to our dialog, we need to declare all these constants at the beginning of the code. So having added our constants at the beginning of the code, we now have to set up the code within our application that will display those icons on the new buttons. So back to the dialog again. So we're going to use our button plus library to add these icons to each of the dialogs in turn. 
when using a prefix command to save a bit of typing. We're calling the button plus function with a number of parameters. The dialog handle, the object we wish to put the icon on, the fact that we're adding an icon, the icon we wish to add, and the width of the icon in pixels. So we'll put an entry in for each of our five buttons. And with these in place, if we try running the application now, we'll see at the top right hand corner of our dialog, we now have a number of large buttons. One button to allow you to add a new form, buttons to go to the end of the form list, the beginning of the form list, and buttons to go back or forward one form at a time. And the label underneath will tell us the form number. Ideally, we want to add tooltips to these two to indicate to the user what each of the buttons will actually do. So we will go to our callback function, our event handler, and we'll put some tooltip calls in. So with each of these in place, we should now have tooltips on the new buttons. If we try running the application now, and if we hover over one of the buttons, a tooltip should appear. For the first form, the previous form, the next form, the last form, and to create a new form. We'll want this label underneath the buttons to indicate which form we're actually on. And we're going to be treating the form data slightly differently. Since at any point in time the user may well have created several forms already, we'll want the application to load these forms into a global array. This will allow us to cycle through each of the forms in turn using these navigation buttons. So when the application first loads, it will be sitting on form number one. So we're going to be using yet another library. We're going to add the PB Windows Controls library. I'll cover the functions that we're going to be using in this library when we get to them in the code. So we're going to add two more global pieces of information. One to hold the current form number and one to hold the details of all the forms in a string array. So having defined that global string array, in our PB main function, when the application launches, we need to check for the data file to see if it has already been created. And if it does, to load the data into that global string array. So we're going to create a function to populate that global form array. And if that function is successful, then we will set the global form number to be equal to the total number of forms held on the array plus one. This allows us to have a blank record at the end of the array. So let's now go and create this populate the form array. This new function takes no parameters. So until we know otherwise, we'll assume the form number is form number one. And we've created a local variable to store the name of our input file, the file that will contain all the data we're going to be reading in. We can get that from the config file itself. So we first need to find where the data file actually exists. So we're going to call another routine called return save file value, which will give us the path and the name of the data file. We'll create that new function in a moment. But if that file does exist, then we can then populate our string array using one of the functions in our library, the read file into an array function. It takes two parameters, the name and the path of the file, and the array to populate. So let's now create the new return save file value. The purpose of this function is to find the button whose function is save. And it will return the value in the field name column. This will be the path and the name of our data file. So as we have done in previous videos, we're going to be using the parse find command to find from our config header line, the columns for object, function, and field name. This tells us which column we need to interrogate. Then it's a simple matter of looping around each record in the config file, looking for one which is a button and one whose function is save. As there will only be one record in that config file whose function is save. And having found that, we can then return the string in the field name column. So this function is very similar to some of the functions we've done previously. So having populated this global string array, we can now go into our callback function, our event handler, and we'll put a new function in inside the initialized dialog section to load up the form with the data within the first record, should it exist. So immediately after we call the 
populate form function which puts the objects on the dialog, we now have to call a new function to populate those controls on the dialog with data. And we'll call that full form with record. It takes three parameters the handle of the dialog, the handle of the label that's going to contain the form number, and the form number itself. So here is the skeleton of our new function. This is going to look at the data CSV file and pull the record out that we wish to display on the screen. So we're going to need some local variables to keep track of each of the rows and columns we're actually dealing with. So having defined each of these variables, we now have to pull the headers in from the zero element of the global array. This tells us the name of each column. So if the record number we're looking for is actually greater than the number of records in the array, then we know we've reached the end of the forms. So the data for this last form will be a zero length string. This will allow the user to add a new form to the end of the list. Otherwise, we're just going to populate the data variable with the data that exists in the array for that global record. And then as we've done before, we need to pull back the column number for the field name, the ID, and the object from the config file, just as we've done before using the parse find command. Now we're going to do a for next loop for each of the columns in our config file. So first pulling back the column from our headers variable. And now we'll read each row in the config file to see if we can find a match in order to get the control ID of the object itself. This gives us the control and the object. And assuming we've found the one we're looking for, we can then exit the for next loop. So if the control value is greater than zero, then the control has been identified. So we now have to populate it with data based on the type of object. Is it a text box? Is it a drop down list? Or is it a list box? And we'll do this with a select case statement. These are the three different types of object that we're going to be populating. The text box with free text, the drop down list will be a selection from the combo box, and the list box will be a selection from the list box. The text box is a simple control set text. The select combo is coming from our new Windows control library, and the select list box also coming from there. These will obviously take a number of parameters. The handle of the dialog, the handle of the control, and the data we're wanting to put into it. In this case, we're using the parse command to pull out from our data variable the data that's held in our global array. So now that we've updated the dialog controls, we now have to update the form number so the user can see which form number they've actually loaded. And we'll also display a message in the status box to say that the form has been successfully loaded. Both of these using the simple control set text command. I've replaced the user data CSV file to give us a record with more data in it. This one now has seven records. So let's try running our application. Well, our application loads quite happily and it's now sitting at form number eight, which would be the next form to be created. We haven't added any code underneath our button jet to allow us to navigate, so that'll be the next thing to do. Back to the callback function, the event handler. So in our event handler, we have to add an event for each of the buttons to allow it to actually function. So for example, if we're adding an event for the button new, the button the user will click on to generate a new form. We can then update the global form number by taking the largest number of records within the array and adding one. We can then redimension our global array, preserving the data within it for the new size. So if we had seven records before, we would now have eight. And we can now call the function we created earlier to fill the form with data for that record. As the user in this case has clicked on the new button, we'll know that all the data is going to be empty. But our function should populate it quite nicely. So if the user clicks on the first button to go to the very first form, we know the form number is going to be form number one. And we'll call the same generic routine again to populate the dialog controls with the data from that form. As you will now see the pattern coming up here. On the last form, we then have to pick up the form number being the upper bounding of the array. So this will go to the very last form. And again, call the same routine again 
to populate it with the data. For the button next, we do a test to see if the current form number is at the very end of the array. If it is, we do nothing. If it is not, then we increment the form number. Then we'll call the same function again to fill the form with the record data. And our final button is the back button, to move to the previous form. So if the form number is greater than 1, then we decrement the form number, and then fill the form with the record. So if we try running that code now, we're currently sitting on form number 8. So if we click the first form button, it should populate the first entry. And then we should be able to step through each of the entries for form 2, form 3, form 4, form 5, form 6, form 7. And if we try to go to form 8, it's the blank one, the one at the end of the array. And it won't let us go any further. If we click on the plus to give us a new form, it will move on to form 9. So now that we've updated the data on screen to allow us to navigate through our global array, what happens when we click the OK button? We'll need to change our saving routine because all the data is currently held in memory. And we can quite easily save the entire array back to the CSV file to complete the saving of our data. So back to the code. If we have a look at our event handler, we'll find that in our callback function, there is a run control process function. This function processes the events for the configurable items on our dialog. If we have a look inside this function, this is where the save is actually triggered. There's a validate form function followed by a save form data. So our save form data function is going to have to be amended. So for the moment, we'll comment out these lines of code and we'll add some new code. We're already in this function working out what the output file name is actually going to be. So as the user has just updated one form, we first need to save that form to the global array. And we can do that using the getFormData function, which already exists. This pulls all the information off the dialog and puts it into the data variable. And our next task will be to insert this data into the appropriate place in the array. So this will be another new function. And we'll call this function insert to array. It will take three parameters. The data line to insert, the form number we're going to be saving, and the name of the global array we're going to be saving to. We'll create this new function in a moment. But on the assumption that this new function will return true to say that the information has been successfully saved to the array, we now have to save it back to the file. And we can do this quite easily by using one of the functions in our file handling library, the array dump function, which takes the contents of a single dimension array and saves it to a file. So all we need to do now is to create this new insert to array function. So there is the skeleton to our function with its three parameters, the data line, the form number, and the name of the array. So first we need to check to see if the form number is greater than the maximum number of records in the array. If it is, we will redimension the array, preserving the data within it, using the redim preserve command. And then having done that, it's a simple matter of updating that element of the array, the element being the form number and then we can return true. So if we try running our application now, it will display the last form, which is form number 8. If we go to the beginning, there's form number 1, and to the end, form number 8. If we look at the data in here, we'll see that form number 7 is incomplete. So let's go back to form number 7. And we want to populate the address and the skill for this particular user, plus their age. And if we hit the OK button, and that should save it to disk. So let's go back and compare the new data with the old data. And there is our new data. We have the address, the skill, and the age in the new file. So in summary, what we've achieved today is we've added navigation tools to the top of our dialog, allowing the user to move forward and backward through the list of forms that have already been keyed plus giving them a button to add a new form if it's required. 
With these tools, the user can check the data that's been entered in each form and make corrections where necessary, giving the user more confidence in the data that they've actually entered. We'll look to add more functionality in the next video. But that's it for today. Thank you for watching.